Okay, everybody, welcome back. This is uh, is part two of uh, our talk with Tom Secker on his book, Secret Spies in 7-7. And uh, the first part, of course, will be available on my website, which is porkinspolicyreview.wordpress.com. And... Tom, I, I think we've more or less discussed the the basics of the case, the outline, and the uh, the evidence that you present, and and your theories on the case. Um, and so maybe we can move a little bit away from that and discuss this uh, notion of predictive programming, which is something that you go into in quite a bit of detail in both uh, your uh, your films on Seven Seven, and especially in this book. And this is uh, something that I think a lot of people might have a little bit of trouble kind of accepting at first. Uh, but essentially, it's this this idea of using the media to sort of program people into having a particular response. And, and maybe you could go uh, uh, give a better sort of definition of predictive programming. And then we can we can jump into uh, all of this, this uh, eerily predictive programming that was put in in the years prior to 7-7. Yeah, sure. I mean... The simplest way, I think, of defining predictive programming is the propaganda of the future. It is propaganda regarding the future. Just as you have propaganda about the past, about you know World War II or whatever, uh, just as you have propaganda about the present, telling you, you know, you need to buy this thing, you need to vote for this party, whatever, you have propaganda regarding the future. Because if you can control people's perceptions of the future and expectations, you can, to a certain extent, control their reactions. And... All of this is the whole purpose of propaganda in the first place, is control. Um, so, in as it works w- regarding individual events, such as 9-11 or 7-7, what you typically see, and what you do see in both of those cases, is central details, core details, of what happens in the event itself being predicted in books, TV shows, films, in the years before the event. And you can, I mean, you can go a bit crazy with this stuff. I, uh, when I was recently in Lille presenting at the FOSA 2013 conference, sadly the video of that is not available yet, but it should be available. (laughs) Um, But one of the things I I, I drew people's attention to in my presentation was a book from uh, 1910, would you believe it? which is about the anarchists, the big terrorists of the day. Uh, <laughs> one of, the, one of the, uh, the climax of this book, there is even a picture of this, a aircraft is hijacked and used to attack skyscrapers in New York City. Really? And when you look, and when you look at the image from this, uh, you see the sort of you know, crumbling skyscrapers and crowds of people sort of you know, streaming and running away. It's so like 9-11. <laughs> it's unreal that this is nearly a century beforehand. Mm. I'm not saying that was put in there by the same people who did 9-11. <laughs> right. later, but I'm just trying to give you a sense of, you know, there is a lot of this kind of stuff out there. Some of it is done deliberately. Some of it isn't. Mm. I tend to focus, because I'm talking about 7-7 as a potential black operation, or as a probable, or almost certain, you might argue, black operation. I'm looking at the predictive programming that I think is relevant to that. There is other artwork and and what have you that in some way predicts 7-7 that I didn't look at in the book or in my films, because I considered it, like this 1910 novel, more a sort of philosophical curiosity than a part of a black operation. But just to give you a sense, you know, this is the kind of thing that you will see out there. And as soon as you switch on to this being a possibility, you will start spotting it in in quite a lot of places. And so with 7-7 in particular, I focused on the TV shows that... We're almost always talking about TV shows, though I have started to find some books that also did this. Um... That pre- between 9-11 and 7-7, what was on television that was preempting and predicting terrorist attacks in the future? We had a bunch of different programs, but one of the most important ones was Spooks, which broadcast in the US as MI5. Mm. And people who were watching TV at that time will remember this series. 
And this was this quite, quite sort of slickly made action series based inside MI5. And they, it's a kind of terrorist of the week, if you like. <laughs> format. You know, like, like in right. X-Files. Yeah, you know, exactly. The week. Same sort of thing, but MI5 terrorist of the week. And so, you know, they're, they're fighting every conceivable terrorist that you might dream up. But there is a curious pattern whereby the only references to suicidal terrorists are references to Muslim terrorists. They repeatedly depicted Muslim suicide bombings prior to 7-7. And they also predicted, shall we say, some of the details on 7-7 that have subsequently been looked at by alternative conspiracy theorists and turned into the core evidence for their alternative theories. So, you have this TV show predicting not just the official story of 7-7, Muslim suicide bombings, and not just predicting it in one episode, but predicting it in multiple episodes. And you also have them predicting most of the alternative theories of 7-7. And so I'm wondering, are they not only conditioning people before the event to accept the official story... Muslim suicide bombers, were they also conditioning people to accept some of these, I would think, misleading alternative theories? Hmm. So that no matter what people's reaction to 7-7, it took them away from the truth. It took them away from what really happened here. So, like you say, some people are going to say that's a pretty wacky and crazy idea. But consider this. Spooks is not the only TV show in which this happened, but there are several others. They were all produced by the BBC, which is the British state broadcaster. They are supposedly independent of government. They're not. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) You know, the idea that they can make a BBC TV show about MI5 and it be independent of MI5 is... is, (laughs) It's absurd. That doesn't happen. And in fact, we know from various commentaries i have the the box sets of this series because it's a very important series in my research Uh, and listening to the commentaries on this they're frequently making reference to the contact they had with mi5 and mi6 in the production of this show it's not done in quite the same way as the cia entertainment industry liaisons and their public affairs office it's not quite as formal as that but it's the same basic process it's clear from various interviews with the uh, screenwriters that they were plumbing ex-spooks and even in some cases current spooks for storylines and ideas and things to put in their in their episodes and put in their scripts. So there's a mechanism by which MI5 specifically could have been doing this. It's a physical possibility. That's one thing to consider. The other is that all of these different shows, all being produced by the BBC, add up to maybe 15 different programs in a a three-and-a-half-year period. What are the odds of all of those TV shows predicting basically the same memes, the same details, sometimes in different combinations, within that very short time frame? Well, I don't think the odds are are that good. If we're only talking about one or two shows that predicted something about 7-7, it'd be like, well, there's that many TV shows being made that, of course, they're going to predict a few details about the future. Whereas when you have this, it seems, concerted, repeated effort to hammer home these same memes, these same ideas, these same stories and narratives, it, it, it strikes me that it must have been at least to some extent deliberate. I don't know that every single one of these shows was being deliberately kind of scripted in some way by MI5, but some of them certainly were. Some of them must have been. Oh, yeah, and I, I think one of the, the strongest examples that you point to in the book is this episode of Spooks, which was broadcast on July 7th, a few years prior to the bombing. And in this episode, it features a bomb plot that's taking place while a drill is being run by the security services. And I believe this is the only episode where MI5 can't stop the attack. And this, of course, is one of these very... Um, 
you know, not, I don't want to say well-established alternative theories, but this is one of the main alternative theories that gets trumpeted by a lot of different people, not with a, very much evidence to it. But uh, the fact that it was broadcast on July 7th, you, you talk about how, you know, in a lot of you know very cons- uh, conspiracy-oriented mindset, you know, numerology comes into to play. But just the fact that this is dealing with an episode d- with a drill, which uh, there, there was something, some sort of drill that was going on. Uh, the significance of that, I think, is, 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 a, is to lead people in a different direction. But I found that to be the most uh, kind of just in your face predictive programming. Well, OK, let me just correct you on one thing there. It's the episode where there is, uh, which is a couple of ones earlier than the exercise episode. Oh. Uh, the one a couple of episodes earlier is the one, the first one with the Muslim suicide bomber. And that is, I think, the first episode of Spooks where they completely fail to stop the plot. Mm, mm. So they managed to stop some anarchists. They managed to stop some animal rights people. They managed to stop whoever. But they can't stop the Muslim suicide bomber. And that is, of course, the narrative we're given after 7-7 is, oh, well, we can't stop every plot. You know? <laughs> Mm. So they predicted the whole sort of intelligence failures discussion in that one Muslim suicide bomber episode. Then a couple of episodes later, it was on July 7th, 2003. So exactly two years before 7-7, the BBC broadcasts this episode where MI5 are running a emergency response training exercise, some kind of training drill. And in the middle of this exercise going on, there is a real attack. Now, the twist at the end of the episode is actually that the attack was all just simulated as part of the exercise. But for about half an hour there, you're sat there being hit with this exercise at the same simulation at the same time as reality exercise at the same time as real attack. You're you're being presented with this entire scenario that, of course, after 9-11, a lot of people were talking about the NORAD exercises mm. and what have you that were going on that morning and the, and the FEMA one in the World Trade Center. And quite rightly, because with 9-11, it's extremely suspicious that you have all of these overlapping exercises and training drills going on at the exact same time as a real attack. But with 7-7, the situation's a bit different. You only have one exercise being run that morning. It's not being run by a government agency. It's being run in the private sector. The scenario is eerily similar to what really happened, but we don't have any direct evidence connecting that exercise to the attack for real. So we've always got to wonder, what is the connection? And not just that Spooks episode, but another show that also broadcast both in the UK and the US, the two big conspiracy markets, if you like, um was a a film called uh, Dirty War, which was made in 2004, broadcast shortly after 9-11-2004. It was made by HBO and the BBC, joint production. It depicts Muslim suicide bombers. It depicts four Muslim suicide bombers attacking London, and two of them actually attack Liverpool Street Station, one of the stations that was attacked on 7-7. So it predicts the official version just as much as any of the episodes of spooks uh, uh, predicts the official version now at the opening of this film there is a disaster response training exercise that is mirrored at the end of the film with the real attack so you also have this not quite the same thing where it's happening simultaneously but this notion of we're preparing for a scenario with an exercise and then the real thing happens it fulfills our prediction so uh with 7-7 you have two slightly different versions of this theory you have the idea that the exercise being run on the morning of 7-7 when the real attacks was happening was cover for some kind of false flag operation you also have the theory that exercises being run before 7-7 were preparation for the real attack and both of these theories were predicted on television in the years before 7-7. So you have both versions of this drill gone live theory about 7-7 being presented to us and being preconditioned in the public's mind through the medium of entertainment before we ever even had any evidence that this was going on on 7-7. And so I'm wondering, was that exercise on the morning of 7-7 
being run not to provide cover for the real attacks in terms of actually carrying them out, but to provide a bit of smoke and mirrors and a few misleading cul-de-sacs that don't really go anywhere, a sort of false conspiracy theory made to measure for conspiracy theorists, mm. but alternative conspiracy theorists. And there, thus are these TV programs, uh, predictive programming mm. aimed at us, aimed at the alternative crowd rather than aimed at the general public. So you have the suicide from a predictive uh, <laughs> <laughs> and and you have the exercise um, predictive programming aimed at the alternative public. So they're trying to dominate both different crowds, mainstream and alternative, trying to dominate their perceptions and precondition them before this event ever happened. And I think the answer to is all of that, what's going on? I think the answer is yes. And I again, I present this case and try and document it as thoroughly as possible mm. in the book. And you know, you can watch these TV shows for yourself and make mm. up your own mind. And you, you also point out some of the uh, historical instances of predictive programming and prop- propaganda, which goes back to World War II. Uh, you know, you, you make you, you really do present a very full case uh, that this is a real phenomenon and that it, it does happen. And of course, you don't want to fall down the rabbit hole into thinking that like every film that comes out is, is predictive programming. Uh, but th- there are real instances and. And, and I think the, the 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 sort of part that really kind of forces you into into looking at this as a real thing are all of these um, uh, training ex- drills that are run in the years leading up to seven seven, uh, and there are a whole bunch of different ones that you document, and so many of them deal with this notion of bombs on the London Underground. And, and of course, if you are running all of these drills and training exercises to prepare uh, the the actual people who are going to be involved in this, uh, you know, it begs the question of then, well, how could you, how could something like Seven Seven happen? Uh, and maybe we, we could we could look at some of these drills. That, you know, you mentioned Osiris Two, you mentioned Atlantic Blue, a, a whole series of things, uh, and also the the effect that that has on the general public as well in shaping their 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 views of what's going on around them. Well, sure. I mean, you have basically two different batches. You have a series that are being run by the emergency services, the police and ambulance service and what have you. Actually, physical live boots on the ground drills on the London Underground. And they were running those once a year, pretty much before uh, between 9-11 and 7-7. They were also running a whole series of other exercises, most of which were desktop. They were just people in offices. They weren't actually people out on the streets responding to fake bombings. Um, so you have you have both basically both types of exercise, both types of preparation. Now, with ones where you've got people actually boots on the ground inside underground stations responding to bombings or whatever it is that the scenario is it they've come up with, uh, you've got to wonder why is it that their equipment didn't work very well on 7-7? Why is it that, for example, the a lot of the emergency service radios don't work on large sections of the underground network? Why is it that they couldn't actually speak to one another, so you couldn't have a policeman talking to a paramedic via the radio system that they've both got? You know, why why is it that these things didn't work on seven seven? Mm. Given that they must have exercised, you know, they'd, they'd trained for this, they'd simulated this, they'd found out that this didn't work, and yet they didn't fix it. <laughs> so. This tells you something. It tells you that these exercises are not about fixing problems. They are not about responding better when a disaster actually happens. That is not the point of them, because if it was the point of them, then they would respond better when things actually happened. So, what is the point of them? I think the point of them is, again, as a form of preconditioning, a form of, if you like, predictive programming. It's a way of programming the people who will respond, the actual ambulance men and you know, the police and, and the firemen and whoever else actually go in and respond when something terrible happens. It preconditions them. It gets them thinking about the sorts of scenarios that they'll face. And so when they first hear, say, Muslim suicide bomber, they'll accept it. And you find when you actually read the testimony from the inquests of various emergency service personnel, it's remarkable how uh, how quickly a lot of them did buy into this official story, even though they were on the ground. Mm. They had physical evidence in front of them, which, from all accounts and from all the evidence that we now have, 
didn't say suicide bombings, and yet they believed that. So that's one dimension of this. The other is that in these uh, desktop training exercises, in particular Atlantic Blue, which was run in April 2005, so a few months before 7-7, and this involved thousands of people, but it was all in office. Um, this was like a week-long exercise, exercise based around the same basic scenario as 7-7, bombings on the underground and bombings on buses. So they predicted what would then happen a few months later. But one of the most curious things about Atlantic Blue is the use of what they call pseudo-media, which is fake news. They produced hours and hours of fake news broadcasts about these attacks and fed this, these new broadca uh, news broadcasts to the exercise participants, to the people working on the exercises, and monitored their reactions. And one of the documents I include in the book is an extract from a sort of internal home office publication about Atlantic Blue, where they're interviewing one of the people who worked on this pseudo-media, who worked on this fake news. And they say, basically, the purpose of this was to see if we could get the exercise, the people doing the exercise, to respond in a certain way if we get them a certain bit of information. Is that not predictive programming? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, what we're, what we're talking about here? Mm. And there you have it, in, in black and white, or if you read the original version, you get all kinds of silly colours. <laughs> it's this awful... Mag <laughs> what is it? What is... It's called CBRN News. Mm. So CBRN, Chemical Biological Radiological oh, right. yeah, Weaponry. <laughs> and it's CBRN News. A wonderful <laughs> magazine title. <laughs> well, think about what sort of people would produce a magazine mm. like mm. that. Who think, let's make a magazine called CBRN News. You'd have to be pretty, pretty screwed up in the head to begin with yeah. to even consider making a magazine like that, let alone what it contains and... And like I say, this is a sort of internal home office publication. It's completely mm. unclassified, but of course no one knows about it because who goes and bothers to read the internal home office publications? Because most of them are incredibly boring. Mm. Um, but this one, it's all about this string of exercises being run before 7-7. It was a very short-lived magazine. And I read every issue of this because I was trying to find out more about these exercises. And when I read this thing about pseudo-media, I was, I was just astounded that they'd, they'd put this out there, that they'd basically admitted that the point of the Atlantic Blue exercise, at least, was to predictively program the emergency services. And thus, it's not much of a leap from that to the notion of, oh, they're using entertainment shows to predictively program the general public. Mm. And yeah, there, are, there are also some, some of these uh, entertainment programs uh, like Panorama, London Under Attack, that, that also feature fake news. Uh, and again, these you know people in some sort of situation room trying to deal with uh, attacks on the London Underground, and they also use the, these uh, pseudo fake news broadcasts. Yeah, they did. Um, that's probably the most notorious bit of Seven Seven predictive programming is that Panorama episode. Uh, and again, you can watch this on my YouTube channel if you just look for Panorama London Under Attack, you'll find it. And this was where they got a group of so-called experts. And like you say, they stuck them in a situation room scenario. They basically sat around a table being fed information via mocked up news broadcasts about a suicide bombing attack on the London Underground. And this show was being made in May, to, it was broadcast May 2004. So over a year before 7-7. And funnily enough, um, it was, if I, if memory serves, it was broadcast on the exact same day as there was an exercise in New York based on bombings on the, <laughs> on the underground, on the metro system in New York. So, a bit weird, mm. I would say. <laughs> yes, certainly. <laughs> the, I... point, the significance of that is, but it was a weird detail when I noticed mm. that. I was mm. going through the timeline and that happened on the exact same day. Um, so, you have that program. You also have another one, which was called Crisis Command, which sadly there doesn't seem to be any record of. You can't get copies of these episodes anymore. Um, where well, they had the same sort of thing, but they had members of the public. So they'd have three members of the public sat around a table being fed fake news about a terrorist attack, and they would have to decide <laughs> how to respond to it. And it was a sort of game show format, whereby they had to say, you know, do we shoot down the plane or not, for example? Um, 
and inevitably they'd sort of dither and say, oh, no, I don't really want to make the order to shoot down a plane. And then they'd see news footage of, you know, plane crash <sighs> houses Parliament or something. So it was this sort of, you know, the more brutal and the more kind of fascistic you are, the mm. better you do in this game mm. show format. <laughs> So again, it's it, you know, is this not all a form of predictive programming? Is this mm. not all about trying to uh, shape people's perceptions of these events before they've even happened, or alternatively shape their perceptions of events as they are happening and shortly after they've happened? Because they would use the same methods, regardless of at what point in time you're talking about, regardless of what your temporal relation is to the event. As I said at the top, propaganda regarding the past, propaganda regarding the present, propaganda regarding the future they do it all mm. and and it 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 does beg the question uh, uh you know when when the when 7 7 actually did take place how much of the media was simply uh, whether they were conscious or unconsciously doing this just sort of feeding into oh well okay well of course it, it has to be al-qaeda because you know for the past several years we've seen nothing but muslim suicide bombers bombing the london underground and I do. I, I started to wonder how much of this is obviously, you know, the BBC and some of the. I mean, they are propaganda arms for the British government. But you do wonder, on some level, how much of the the news was just merely parroting what they had been told for so for so long, for so many years, leading up to seven seven. You mean you're, that you'd have all these Guardian journalists and journalists for the Times and whatever? They've also been predictively programmed with this stuff. Yes, yeah. That that, that you know, if you if you're con- if you if all you see is this constant stream of Muslim suicide bombers on the London Underground, uh, you know, I, I it's very easy to then when it does happen. Well, of course it is, you know. And I think you you even point out a I think it was Guardian or, or the Times uh, making note of like. Uh, spooks or another show uh oh wow you know spooks always gets it right in the future they they they, they manage to predict these these wild events uh you know and it was sort of tongue-in-cheek and kind of like oh isn't that a creepy coincidence but uh you know w- perhaps that could have been them sort of unconsciously being like oh yes it, this is happening and and spooks got it right or, or I, I don't really know I, i'm not sure what to make of that um, you, you're right. There was an article. I think it was called uh, "Spooks: The Drama That Predicts the Future." I think it was I don't know some newspaper anyway. And yeah, they published a couple of years after Seven Seven. They noted one of the various Spooks <laughs> episodes that that predicted managed to predict Seven Seven. Um, they seem to have managed to overlook the you know ten others. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> but whatever, they're British mm. journalists. They're as, yes. as they're, they're not very good. Um, but yeah, people have twigged that this is something that is is real, but no one in the mainstream seems to have recognised the significance of it, or they always put it down to some kind of weird, kooky thing, mm. rather than the notion yes. that a show about MI5 that's produced with the help of, of MI5 might have some kind of black information in it, mm. you know? <laughs> of course, they never ask that question. Um, <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I think the journalists themselves are subject to this whole process. Mm. And even actually with the with the suicide bomber episode of Spooks, or the first suicide bomber episode of Spooks, which is uh, season two, episode two, um, one of the actors who, since leaving Spooks, has almost exclusively appeared in either spy dramas or movies about transhumanism. <laughs> it's, it's funny following these people's careers yeah. and what sort of things they end up doing. It's, it's also amusing, like, uh, one of the terrorists in Dirty War, this another this film that predicted 7-7, uh, then a year later turns up as one of the MI5 agents in Spooks. Mm. Mm. <laughs> so, you know, yeah, <laughs> that, that's weird. You know, it must be confusing for him, let alone for us. Mm. Uh, yeah, one of the actors in this Suicide Bomber episode, one of the Spooks, one of the MI5 characters, he actually said in an interview... But when he first read the script for that episode, he was like, oh, this is going to be a bit controversial. And he was kind of worried about um, them. The way he put it was, let's not put ideas in people's heads. <laughs> of course, what ideas are they putting in people's heads? He was obviously talking about, let's not inspire anyone to become a suicide bomber. But the, if you like, twisted implication of that statement is they were putting the idea of suicide bombers into the public's heads. So... I I always found that statement kind of mm. 
amusing and chilling at the same time. Mm. I think also the uh, uh, something you you also document is the shooting of uh, uh, John Charles Demenez. And uh, this was a man who I think this was a, after seven seven who was mm-hmm. someone saw him and he had you know, they claimed he had wires sticking out of his jacket and he was running and a bunch of uh, cops gunned him down and this is uh, a meme that is repeated over and over and over again in spooks of you know the MI five agents shooting down these terrorists and I thought that that was was such a a moment where people were just, oh yeah, I guess he, he just got caught in the crossfire. You know, that's that's the war on terror. That sucks. And I found that to be the most uh, almost subtle way uh, of predictively programming people to just accept that, yes, you could get gunned down, uh, you know, in a, in a crowded urban area because you were running because someone thought you were a terrorist. Um, yeah, I, I would interpret that string of shootings in not just Spooks episodes, but again, at the end of Dirty War, two of the mm. slim suicide bombers or would-be suicide bombers are shot dead by police snipers. Um, you've got to understand, in the UK, that doesn't happen. The police do not shoot people dead frequently. <laughs> it's not like in the US. Mm. Um, we don't have that many armed police over here. Well, armed, armed with guns over here. So this, we don't have that many police shootings. We have some, I'm not denying that, but this uh, Jean-Charles de Menezes shooting that happened uh, 15 days after 7-7, um, that was a, if you like, a watershed moment, a landmark event that they just shot someone dead on the streets. That was quite unusual and, and shocking for, for British people. So you've got to understand the significance of that. But yeah, that shooting in so many ways, was predicted by all these different TV shows, and almost always it's the same episodes. It's the Mm. same episode where you have some sort of Muslim suicide bomber story culminates with one of these terrorists being shot dead by either armed police or special forces or or whoever. And so, when this happened after 7-7, and they... Basically what happened is you have 7-7, which is a series of bombing blamed on suicide bombers. Two weeks later, you have a series of events that happen on tube trains and buses uh, whereby some Muslim chaps set off devices. They weren't explosives. They were basically hair bleach poured into chapati flour. So these people were either complete idiots (laughs) who were actually trying to blow themselves up and become suicide bombers or they weren't trying to build bombs in the first place. And this was some kind of stunt. And that was their defense at trial, that this was some kind of political stunt or protest. And frankly, that does kind of make quite a lot of sense, given the absurd nature of the so-called bombs that they had. The day after they did their whatever it was that they were doing, Jean-Charles de Menezes left the same block of flats that one of these guys was hiding out in at the security services, supposedly mistook him. They thought that he was this guy that they were looking for, and so they followed him. They followed him on and off a bus, so no worry about him being a suicide bomber at this point. They follow him into a tube station, don't seem as much worry about him being a suicide bomber at that point. He goes down the escalator and onto the platform. At that point, they really start to worry about things, and they chase him down there. He walks onto the train. He, no, he doesn't run. At no, no point in this does he, is he actually really running. Uh, sits down on the tube train. Bunch of armed, su- supposedly police, but there is quite a lot of well-evidenced speculation that this was actually a military unit that did this rather than the police. Burst onto the train, shoot him, drag him to the floor, shoot him a bit more. Kill him stone dead. Amusingly, the driver of the train, when interviewed by the media, said that he thought it was fanatics doing the shooting, that he thought people doing the shooting were terrorists, and perhaps he was right, in a manner of speaking. Mm. He, I think he then runs off down the tunnel and is pursued by an armed police officer. <laughs> so, you know, it's this really crazy event, mm. but their excuse was, oh, well, we thought he, he, we thought he might be a terrorist, we thought he might be a suicide bomber. So that's why we had to do this. We had to stop him. We had to take him out. But there is no evidence of this. And like I say, they followed him on and off a bus. They were perfectly happy to catch a bus. But suddenly when he goes underground, where it's much harder for people to see him and it's much less public, um, they suddenly decide now, oh, shit, he's a suicide bomber. We're going to have to kill him. Um, 
so there is something deeply, deeply wrong with this, but it's not quite sure what. It's not quite sure what mm. the truth is here. Did they deliberately take him out? Did they actually mistake him for someone else? And they were always planning to sort of take someone out as a response to 7-7, and they just got the wrong guy? I mean, I'm not quite sure what. But, yeah, all of this was predicted in the same through the same means that they predicted both the official and alternative versions of 7-7. However, there's one more dimension to this, and that is that one of the other alternative versions of the 7-7 story, one of the other alternative conspiracy theories, is that the alleged bombers were shot dead on the morning of 7-7 at Canary Wharf. Now, I've always found this to be extremely implausible, because for one thing, you wouldn't have to do it. Why can't you just arrest them? Arrest them? take them off to a warehouse somewhere and shoot them there. I mean, for heaven's sake, you don't... If you've got a bunch of guys that you're setting up as Patsy suicide bombers, you don't shoot them in Canary Wharf. Mm. You don't make that big a show and that big a song and dance of it. That's not how black operations are run. It just isn't. Um, you would only shoot someone in public if your aim was to get a big public reaction, to make a big song and dance and a big show of it. You wouldn't do that if you were quietly rubbing someone out. You'd, you know do what they did to michael hastings or whatever <laughs> yes yeah you do something that's that's not so obvious and not so traceable um so i've always found that that story rather that theory rather implausible and the evidence backing it up is virtually non-existent so i wonder with all of this shooting terrorists dead on television before 77 and before the menezes killing were they not only predicting and predictively programming the Menezes killing as a just reaction to 7-7. But were they also, again, predictively programming an alternative version of 7-7 that is misleading and that goes nowhere and that's ridiculous? I think, potentially, they were doing all of this stuff in one go. And I know, for some people, that's going to seem pretty complex and perhaps even absurdly complex. But you've got to remember, these people are spies, this is what they do for a living, is build incredibly complex deceptions. That's how they make their money. So the idea that they're doing that to us kind of strikes me as natural. Now mm. that I've thought about it and now that I've researched it in detail and found, you know, there is abundant evidence that this is going on, it just strikes me as, well, of course they're doing this. Why wouldn't they be doing this? Once they'd figured out that they can, of course they would. Yes, I, th I think any time people uh, think that the security services, oh well, they wouldn't, they wouldn't go that far. I mean, yes, they would. They, they, they certainly would, and they, they have in the past. And of course, if they, if they've figured out a way to do this, and it is very subtle. It, it it's not, it's not so overt as, as you would think. And, and, and as you go through it in the book, I mean, you see, it's this, it's this slow but very persistent, you know, movement towards towards 7-7 with all of these different things going on. And, I mean, you, you, you point, you know, very much to the fact that uh, I, I or I saw that a lot of this predictive programming uh, affected the pub the public at large in a way of dividing people into these two groups of the official conspiracy theory and the alternative conspiracy theory. And for people uh, in the alternative conspiracy theory uh, movement, you know, this, this is really, I think the predictive programming has become very powerful and it has led people into this you know down a rabbit hole into into a cul-de-sac that you can't really get out of and people become obsessed with this peter power or canary war for or any of these things and they they no longer investigate anymore so in that sense this has been a very um powerful tool for the security services to use well i think i think you're right in the specific specific case with seven seven that that's what they were trying to do and that's what they've managed mm -hmm. to accomplish and as someone who has never fallen into either category i've never bought the official story i'm not one of those people who bought the official story and then changed their mind and never believed it for, for a moment um mainly because they never gave me any reason to <laughs> but i've given me some evidence i might have been convinced but um but i've never bought the the popular alternative versions either and i explain in the book in some detail why it is that i don't buy into them um, I've always pursued pretty much the, the MI5 angle and so maybe it's not that surprising that that's the angle I've found the most evidence for but I think it's also true that predictive programming more generally has had this effect on 
what we call the truth movement and even the realization that predictive programming is real has had this kind of stult, uh, stultifying effect on, on the alternative media and the truth movement because now they see predictive programming in everything mm. and that, that reduces it to being meaningless it reduces it to just being you know I can't even write a poem without you know someone else <laughs> using me of predictive programming I'm not saying this has actually happened I'm giving a, a, a hypothetical example that in the truth movement you can't really make any prediction without someone saying oh it's predictive programming you're all trying to deceive us mm. and they've also turned the the exercise thing this realization that sometimes training exercises are then echoed in reality into every last bloody exercise out there they're chasing it and saying oh it means that there's going to be a flood here or mm. there's going to be a hurricane there or there's going to be a terrorist attack over there and none of these times has, has this ever proven right mm. no one has found a way to turn either watching training exercises or watching tv shows into a means of predicting the future Okay, mm. the alternative me media is obsessed with doing this, and every time they get egg on their face. And I have someone who's watched this over a period of several years. Now I kind of find it quite funny. I kind of find it quite, <laughs> amu quite amusing to watch these predictions, mm. and I'm just going, nope, that's not going to happen. Mm. Oh, <laughs> yeah, everything. Uh, Olympics like, and all, all sorts of... Uh... Oh, totally, the Olympics. There was yeah. loads of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And people went absolutely crazy with it. And I... Yeah. I I was talking for, for months beforehand, for years beforehand, saying, no, nothing is going to happen at the Olympics. I stake my reputation yes, on it. Yes, Precisely because, you know, there's so much hype about this that I can't help but yeah. think the hype is being stoked. The hype is being manufactured so that we're all looking in that direction rather than looking at, you know, the economic collapse that's going on around us, mm. for one thing. Mm. Um, and so, but instead, people were obsessed with oh, there's this. Look at the symbolism in the in the mascots that have been designed and stuff like this. And I'm like, okay, maybe there is some symbolism there, but really, is this the most kind of useful way of spending your time? Is this really productive in your life? Is this really advancing your understanding of the world and the people around you, or is this just you obsessing over some graphics that have been invented by who knows who for who knows what purpose? And with the Olympics, it turned out to be a complete distraction. And so my, my instinct on that was right. I'm not saying don't look at this stuff at all. Of course, I, I spent a long time looking at this stuff with regards to 7-7. But don't get so carried away with it that the, the flashy images and decoding the flashy images becomes your whole way of dealing with politics. Because there are much more important political things out there than that. And what what gets to me is just the idea that you can have people in the truth movement, alternative media, however you want to categorize that, who can totally buy into the idea that the you know there 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 is an invisible government, the the security services, they they do act above everyone else, and yet that they would be so utterly convinced that they would, you know put it out there in the open with, oh, there's a drill, that means that this is happening. I mean, you know, I, I, I don't understand how they can't see that maybe this, this, this drill is really the, you know, the deception is just look at the drill and focus on the drill and then all the way over here we're going to be doing something else and you're not going to be looking there. And I, it just boggles me that they fall into the same trap that, if other people did that about an official story or whatever, you know, you would have people screaming, you've got to wake up, sheeple, and, and, and all of that. But they, they, they manage to fall into this same exact trap, and they, they don't seem to be aware of it. And now it's to the point where anytime there's a drill, th this is, you know, some ruse to commit some act. And I just don't understand why they would do that. And, uh, you know, these people who run these intelligence agencies are smart. They, they know that people get obsessed with these drills, and I, I see that as hence why there's always a drill. No matter what it is that's going on, there's always some sort of drill that people can then point to and say, oh, this is what was really happening. Well, I think that, that that's one way of interpreting it now, particularly in the kind of post-9-11 truth movement, where with 9-11, or at least up until that point, I think there was this correlation between... Mm you know using exercises as some kind of cover for a black op there are plenty of documentable cases of that and i think 9-11 was probably one of them uh after 9-11 that's when i start to wonder and yes one of the reasons why i wonder is because when you look at the way that particular idea of the exercise that goes live has played out in popular media 
the places it turns up in are very, very curious. And let me give you three examples. The first is Enemy of the State, the film, 1998 film, Enemy of the State, which kind of predicted the whole Edward Snowden thing, among other stuff. Yes. Um, and, and where a building is blown up by the company Controlled Demolition Incorporated. Um, <laughs> there you now, go, in, folks. In, in, the, in that film, that film is, is fascinating for a, a million different reasons. But in that film, you have the NSA chasing around Will Smith, right? Um, and for whatever reason. Um, and they, the team that is recruited within the NSA to do this sort of black op on Will Smith is told that they're running a training exercise. And at the end of the film, when this whole thing's gone horribly wrong and a bunch of people have wound up dead, some of these surveillance operatives were saying, oh, well, we just, we just thought this was a training exercise. So that's one, and that's in 1998. Two, you've got the Spooks episode that predicted 7-7, right? That... Uh, two years before 7-7 seven, seven, mm. you have this exercise gone live storyline in a Spooks episode 3 is in the first Iron Man film where have you seen the first Iron Man film? I actually have not, no I, I okay. can't stand Robert Downey Jr. to be honest okay. okay, fine, well if you can't stand him, don't watch it because <laughs> yeah. it's him in full yes, right, yeah you know, he's completely, a complete narcissist in that mm. film um both him and the character he's playing. But in that, there is a bit where he's flying around in his Iron Man suit and he gets into a bit of a tussle with a couple of uh, U.S. Air Force jets that try and shoot him down because they don't know what this thing is. He's a UFO, right? Mm. <laughs> and at the, after they've found a way out of this problem, the, uh, he's, he's talking to his buddy in the U.S. Air Force and the guy says, well, you know, how are we going to cover this thing up? And, in, and, Iron, and Iron Man responds, well, just tell him the usual thing. Just say it was a training exercise. <laughs> and then it cuts to them, you know, U.S. Air Force spokesman saying in this training exercise this morning. <laughs> so you have in these three different productions, you have this meme being propagated, right? Now, the fascinating thing about these is that Enemy of the State was produced with the cooperation of the CIA's entertainment industry liaison, Chase Brandon. So this is a CIA-assisted production propagating the exercise meme. Spooks was made with the assistance of former and current spook advisors who were giving them plot lines and telling them how to make this show. So that is the British equivalent. Iron Man was made with the assistance of the Air Force Entertainment Industry Liaison. So you have three different productions. There are other examples, but sticking with those three, you have those three different productions, all of which are propagating this meme that has become very important in the alternative media and all of them are made with the assistance of military and intelligence agencies so what more evidence do you need that they're putting that idea out there mm. that you know they're the ones that are propagating that conspiracy theory for some reason so that should give you considerable pause for thought about what the hell that theory has now become yeah. Oh, and it's it's just and it's everywhere. It it you can't any event is somehow linked to a, a training exercise or a drill, and it, it really is just uh, you, you know you talk about in the book. I mean, people just stop investigating into seven seven because well, I know what the answer is. It was Peter Power and uh, his training exercise, and I just need. It's all about waking up people, uh, which is a sort of a horrible phrase that's become very popular. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I, I don't know. I, I, I used to use that and, and then I, you know, I, I don't know. There's something negative about that that I, I don't really like anymore. Well, there's something that's fundamentally divisive about it. Mm. You're saying those bunch of people are asleep. I am one of the elite that is awake. And I'm like, well, I never actually went through this so-called waking up process that people talk about. I just, I, I, I always had kind of a, a very sensitive bullshit filter. Mm. So. I'm not saying that to kind of big myself up in any way at all. I'm just saying I don't know what people are talking about when they talk about, oh, how I woke up. Because I never went through that. So what do you call me? Am I woken up or not? Yeah. Am I part of this elite club that's woken up or, 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 am, or am I not part of it? Because I haven't had the same experience that they have. And furthermore, there's plenty of people who they wouldn't consider part of their special treehouse woken up club who I would consider perfectly intelligent and politically active people i would also consider lots of people who are part of that club total idiots <laughs> so what does it even mean anymore it just seems like a distinction that says 
I, I'm part of the club and you're not. That's all it really means anymore. It doesn't mean anything politically or intellectually because it has no political or intellectual standard that you can actually apply and say, you know, this is that bunch of people and this is this bunch of people. It's just kind of, oh, these are my friends on the David Icke forum and you're not. Or, <laughs> yes, yeah. Oh, oh yeah. Oh, we, we've talked about this in emails before. I mean, just this this idea that, you know, so many people in the alternative movement get very disillusioned with the whole left-right political thing or, or however, you know, woken up versus not woken up. Uh, but then they, they get involved in, in uh, the alternative movement and they seem to just find the exact same boxes to put themselves in, uh, you know, be it, you know... Uh, sheeple versus non-sheeple or whatever it is and it's it, it uh you, you know you know you you do catch more uh f- flies with honey than vinegar and i think that there's just too much of this uh you know berating people with this is the truth and if you don't believe it then you know go die somewhere or, you know go go run for president because you're evil mm, mm. As, as though your choices either agree with everything that i believe in <laughs> or sod off and do something else and yeah. i don't care it's, Ender, it's, yeah. it's kind of it's, it's it's hostile it's almost passive aggressive um because it's like i don't care about anything apart from the things that i really 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 care about and that's just a really kind of immature way of approaching the world it's an immature approach to politics i'm you know i know people who i know people who vote for mainstream political parties i even know people who vote for rather fringe political parties that i think are terrible but that doesn't mean these people aren't my friends because it's not just about that you know that's it's not i don't have to i don't have such a fragile sense of identity that i have to have everyone believe everything that i believe and sadly most people in the truth movement from my experience do have such a fragile sense of identity that what they're looking for is reinforcement and what they're looking for is confirmation of their bias and what they're looking for is a sense of identity and a sense of belonging and i understand why people want these things and there's nothing wrong with wanting a sense of identity and a sense of, of belonging but when you turn it into some kind of ideological battle where everyone's got to just believe your dogma, it's like, I, I just feel that's so sad and so counterproductive and so immature. And, and until the truth movement and, and the alternative media and things get beyond that and find a way to confront that and leave it behind, I don't think it's, it's ever going to achieve what it can achieve, what its potential mm. is. You know what I'm saying? There's an mm. enormous potential there that's being unrealized because of this rather pointless and petty squabbling over like you say sheeple and waking up and all this nonsense yeah and 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 you know i i think that the uh, in some ways that the truth movement has progressed to a degree where where people do uh you know uh start to to look at them and 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 maybe oh well you know maybe there is something there and uh, just very briefly you you know mentioned in your book again about demos this uh think tank that wrote up this whole th- report on conspiracy theories and how that they were all, you know, conspiracy theories are held by extremists, and that's why they commit things like the Oklahoma City bombing. Uh, mm-hmm. And and they, they talk about we have to infiltrate these groups, and that is certainly going on. But I, I tried to kind of flip that around and say, you see, look, they are concerned because we are reaching uh, at least some minority of people. So that's something to, to sort of look for, and then it, it just... It, it can upset you so much when then, you know, people uh, just fall into this trap that everyone's a shill, everyone is an intelligence agent. Uh, and, you know, you, you talked recently on your podcast with uh, Adam, formerly of the Glasgow Truth Group, and he was infiltrated by somebody. Uh, so it does happen, for sure. But oh, again, it, 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 you know, it, I just, I, I found it so odd. You know, they're obviously scared enough. That they need, that they feel the need to infiltrate, uh, you know, it, just a small group of, of people who sit in a bar and talk. Yeah, they. I mean, you do have to remember these are people who are kind of paranoid by character, right? Um, of course, so of I, course. I, I wouldn't read too much into that, but you're right. We are clearly having an impact on them. I'm not in any way kind of writing off the alternative media or the truth movement. I'm just saying. If we want it to realize its potential, then we have to grow up a bit, basically. Yes. <laughs> um, and, and I do see this happening over the last couple of years. I think people's, uh, particularly because of things like the massive letdown over the Olympics, because so many people were so sort of charged up that, you know, something's going to major is going to happen in the Olympics and then nothing happened. I think at that point, quite a lot of people kind of thought, hang on. Why yeah. did this myth, this total fantasy take over the truth movement? 
and why did we get suckered so easily into this and i think quite a lot of people not necessarily became disillusioned but just started to realize you know there's we need to be a bit more subtle and clever in what we're doing here um and so i do see that happening i do see it shifting in that direction and that's a really good thing um so i suppose trying to be positive and constructive let's just do it a bit quicker and on a larger scale because that's really where the where this thing can go and where it can really have the kind of impact that we want it to have yeah yeah i mean uh, i I, yeah and i I think that there there is also just too much negativity in the the truth movement the alternative movement you know there's just this doom and gloom and uh, there are little bits where we can we can try and stay and ultimately i think if we don't stay positive then then you get stuck into this whole the Illuminati controls everything and there's nothing we can do, mm, mm. you know, which is just another one of these, uh, these little boxes that they, they, you know, someone is trying to put you in there, you know, they're, they're the trap that's been set. Yeah, right? exactly. Exactly. And, and you talk about that in, in your book again as well. Well, t- we've been talking for a while now. We've, we've gotten a little bit off the, the topic of seven, seven, but maybe just very briefly, um, you could just tell us, uh, you, you know, you, at the end of the book, you talk about how we could solve 7-7. And because ultimately this hasn't been solved, no one has been charged, no one has been held accountable for the death of almost 60 people. Uh, and is there a way to to, pro- to progress, to, to solve this? There is, but I suppose it depends on, on, on what you mean by solve. I mean, how much evidence do you want? How much evidence do you need that this... Certainly that there's been a cover-up. There's been a massive cover-up, and that's been obvious almost since day one, really. As to what they're covering up, solving that, it is possible, but I don't hold out an awful lot of optimism that it's going to happen. And I didn't write this book thinking I'm going to be able to somehow cause a new investigation to occur. I, I knew that, that wasn't, that's not a realistic hope. Um, or it's not at this point if things radically alter in the next five to ten years then maybe but after that point it will just become another kind of unsolvable event um but then there is the the court of public opinion and just like with the jfk thing or with 9 11 or with any of these kind of massive traumatic events the court of public opinion is kind of what really matters Mm. um i don't mean to be crass but if those four men didn't kill those 52 other people, I can't really help solve the, the, the case of what happened to those 52 other people beyond what I've already done. Um, I'm not kind of giving up entirely. I'm just saying I've kind of contributed what I've got on that. Mm. Whereas the court of public opinion, you know, to what extent 7-7 continues to traumatize people and continues to be uh, exploited for counter-terror laws and all the rest of it, you know, if we can slow down that process or even reverse that process, that in some ways is probably a bigger victory than solving the the individual case itself. So that's kind of what's on the table for me, I think. Realistically, that's probably the fight that we should be fighting. Yes, and I, I, I would wholeheartedly agree with that. I think, again, we're, we're looking for that answer for that moment where where everything will be okay and that's i don't think that's really going to happen necessarily and we we need to not look to some sort of moment or person to help us achieve whatever it is and we we need to just on our own we need to do this ourselves and with other people around us well we've been talking for a while now tom so i guess we'll probably wrap it up now but before we go please tell everybody where they can go and uh, read your work uh your websites your book your films as well everyone should go and see them yeah sure i mean my main terrorism website for the sort of thing that we've been talking about tonight uh is investigating the terror.com that's all one word investigating the terror.com you can get my book there you can download my films there or watch them by youtube or listen to previous interviews i've done on my book and on various other subjects if you want to learn a bit more about the relationship between the intelligence agencies and culture producers and tv producers then my stuff is on spyculture.com again one word spyculture.com um and you can also download my podcast from there which is called clandestine so check out those two sites for pretty much everything it is that i've done all right awesome and uh, your films yeah, my films are Seven Seven Seeds of Deconstruction and Seven Seven Crime and Prejudice. Crime and Prejudice is the better of the two films, in my opinion. It's better made, and it was the second one that I made, so it 
has more up-to-date information. They're both freely available all over the internet, and you can download them both as AVI files from investigatingtheterror.com. All right, excellent. Tom, thank you so much for coming on the show, and thank you so much for doing uh, such a long episode with me. Oh, thank you, Pierce. It's been a pleasure. Oh, absolutely. All right, we'll have to have you back on soon. Take care. You too. Okay, everybody, so that is the podcast for this week. I'd like to thank Tom Secker again for coming on and and, uh, doing such a great, long podcast with me. It was a real, real treat. And I'd like to thank all of the listeners who took the time and sat down and listened to this. And if you did enjoy what you heard, then I would suggest that you go to porkinspolicyreview.wordpress.com. And there you'll be able to find all of my podcasts, all of the writing that I do, and everything that I'm working on right now. You can, of course, uh, follow through the RSS feed or through email, and you can always find me on Twitter, at Porkins Policy. And if you do like uh, what I'm doing, uh, it would be just a tremendous help if you just spread it around and just tell your friends about it, post it on your your Facebook or whatever you use, uh, and it, it, it really, every little bit helps. So thanks again, and I will be talking to you very soon.